Hey, what's going on AP guys? Chapter 27 review video for t for you today. We have a lot of acts in here, a lot of important stuff that happens in American history. Kind of a longer video, but uh, lots to know, so let's get going. All right, let's start off talking about reasons for imperialism. And, and when we talk about imperialism, that's this idea that a country goes in and, and kind of takes over another country. And the reason why they're doing this and the reason why the U.S. is doing this at the time is they want markets or places to sell their goods beyond American shores. This is a way to make lots of money, particularly for businesses. We have two books you should be familiar with. One is Reverend Josiah Strong's Our Country. And this book, the theme of the book was that Anglo-Saxon civilization or basically white European civilization is better than every other civilization. So it is the duty of those people to go out and spread this message. One of the biggest, most important books that you will absolutely positively have to know is by a guy by the name of Alfred T. Mahan. And he wrote The Influence of Sea Power. And the whole purpose of his book is the stronger a country's navy is, the more powerful that country is, and the more respected it is, and the very, very, very important. And this causes many countries, including the U.S., to build up their navy. Know that book, know the author as well. Another reason that imperialism is happening is there is a desire for a canal connecting the Atlantic and the Pacific. And we, and we will actually see this in Panama. Let's go over to Hawaii for a little bit. Hawaii was attracted to the U.S. because of sugar production. There was a, they had many, many sugar plantations, and there was lots of sugar being produced. Keep in mind, at this time, Hawaii is its own independent country. Since the 1840s, U.S. had a foreign interest in Hawaii, lots of trading with them. In 1887, the U.S. establishes a base at Pearl Harbor, which is still there today. And the U.S. was heavily interested in annexing Hawaii. One of the reasons why was because there was tariffs on sugar. If you annex Hawaii, this is now part of the United States, bye-bye tariffs. Queen, I'm not, I'm sorry, I cannot even pronounce her name. We'll just call her Queen L. She was the leader of Hawaii, and she believed that native Hawaiians should control the island. She was dead set against imperialism, dead set against anybody else controlling Hawaii. Eventually, she's going to be overthrown by after a revolt by planters, and there will be a treaty to annex Hawaii, but Grover Cleveland, who was president in 1893, wants none of it. It's not going to be until McKinley in 1896, uh, after he's elected in 1896, that Hawaii becomes a part of the U.S. Okay, we're going to focus on Cuba right now, which is 90 miles off the shore of Florida. And there was a tariff in 1894 that taxed sugar at a very high rate. So Cuba, uh, they revolted against Spain. Spain is in control of, of Cuba at this time. And they followed a policy of scorched earth, which basically means they're burning everything. So the sugar plantations, the animals are killing the animals. They're burning the plantations. They're just destroying everything in an effort to, to hurt the Spanish. The U.S. is very concerned because they have $50 million worth of investments there and $100 million worth of annual trade. So they do not like this scorched earth policy. They want to see the Spanish gone. We have the Spanish general Butch. Weiler who tried to crush the rebellion and he becomes this bad guy in everybody's eyes um, especially in the US eyes and in US newspapers he throws people into barbed wire reed concentration camps which is uh, not a good place for anybody to be um, people would be starving you were you were in this fence you couldn't escape just a horrific horrific place to be I also have something called Yellow Journalism by two guys, Polst and Pulitzer, um, and one of them, I can't remember which one, supposedly said, you furnish the pictures and I'll furnish the war to one of his journalists. And you go down there, you take pictures of these reconcentration camps, you take pictures of these atrocities, and I'll make sure that there is a war. And then we have uh, the DeLome letter. A Spanish minister is basically talking trash about President McKinley, called him weak, said he catered to the rabble. Um, this is called the DeLome letter. It gets published, and the United States is furious about it. They can't believe that they're talking trash about McKinley. The USS Maine, that mysteriously blows up, and it kills 260 sailors. And the USS Maine was just sent down to Cuba. It was basically stationed in the harbor um, as a way to protect Americans, if need be, and then it mysteriously blows up. Those two things together, the DeLome letter and the USS Maine being blown up, makes many in America want to go to war with Spain. USS Maine and subsequent pictures was a huge cause for U.S. involvement in the war. So February 15th, 1898, this happens, and then the U.S. is in war shortly after. April 11th, 1898, one day before Henry Clay's birthday, by the way, McKinley sends he would have been 100 and... 
21 years old if he were still alive one day later. McKinley sends a message to Congress urging war with Spain, and they accept it. And one thing that goes along with it, please know this, the Teller Amendment, and what that says is once the U.S. overthrew Spanish rule, Cubans would be given their freedom. So there is a promise we're going to fight on behalf of Cuba, of the Cubans, and once the U.S. wins, they'll get their independence. Doesn't quite work out that way. And Mr. Claff of MrClaff.com and MrClaff.com YouTube channel, he has awesome videos. He always talks about the war was fought over a boat and a note. It's a good way to remember it. The boat being the USS Maine and the note being the DeLone letter. Coincidentally, World War I is also going to be fought over a boat and a note. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Rough Riders. My favorite president ever, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, he led this group of volunteers. They played a huge role in the Spanish-American War in Cuba. I'm not going to get into the battles much in here. We're actually going to skip the Philippines and stuff because AP does not ask you about it. I'm sorry if you're interested in it. There's lots of good books out there, but for time, I'm going to skip it. Here is Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, did you notice his legs were need to be glued back together? If you have no idea what I'm talking about, see uh, A Night at the Museum. It's actually a pretty good movie, although he never dated um, Sacagawea. Okay, August 12th, 1898, an armistice or an agreement to stop fighting is signed. 400 Americans died during battle. Very, very, very small amount of Americans died during battle, of actual battle wounds. However, 5,000 died due to disease. I have seen a couple questions before that ask. Most of the Americans were killed during this war as a result of, and the answer is disease. It's a very similar thing to the Mexican-American War. Most Americans don't end up dying from battle, they end up dying from disease. Okay, what does America gain from this? They gain Guam, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. They also gained the Philippines, which is going to pose a problem. They went to war fighting for Cuba, and then all of a sudden they gained the Philippines. So there's this key issue of what to do with the Philippines. And McKinley uh, said he had a revelation from God that he planned to Christianize and civilize them. We have the Anti-Imperialist League. They are against imperialism. People like Mark Twain, the presidents of famous colleges like Harvard and Stanford, Samuel Gompers, who is the president of the AFL, and even Carnegie as well. This big question comes about, don't the Filipinos deserve consent of the governed as well? Don't they deserve to have their own type of government? We also have another important poem, The White Man's Burden, which says that it is the duty or obligation of whites, essentially, to civilize other civilizations. Let's talk about Cuba and Puerto Rico. I'm going to throw a bunch of acts at you today. You need to know each and every one of these. The Forker Act of 1900, shortly after the Spanish-American War. Puerto Ricos are granted limited degree of popular government, and later they are granted U.S. citizenship in 1917. The United States still um, controls Puerto Rico today. There's going to be this question, does the Constitution follow the flag? And what I mean by that is, if the U.S. acquires a new territory, are those people protected with the same rights that Americans are protected with? And this is settled in something called the insular cases. It goes to the Supreme Court, and here's what the Supreme Court says. The Constitution does not apply to new areas. Subjects may be subject to American rule, but they did not enjoy all American rights. So the government can decide how to control people in these new areas or control or make laws or anything, but these people do not have the same rights as Americans. I want you to think about Guantanamo Bay today. This is a base in Cuba. Today there are hundreds, if not thousands, of suspected terrorists that are held in Guantanamo Bay, and they have been held there for 10 plus years now without a trial. If you're an American citizen, you are guaranteed a trial for a crime. In Guantanamo Bay, these people are not, and it's the same idea. Just because the U.S. is in control of an area doesn't mean the people living there have those rights. I hope that makes sense. If you have a question, leave it in the comments and I'll clarify it more for you. In 1902, the U.S. withdraws from Cuba, sort of, but we have something known the Platt Amendment. You need to know the Platt Amendment, probably the most important act so far or amendment that we're talking about. Cuba cannot have treaties with other countries that compromise its independence. The U.S. can intervene and restore order. And most importantly, Guantanamo Bay is given to the United States. So that's why even to today, when, when the U.S. and Cuba don't get along, the U.S. still has Guantanamo Bay. It all goes back to the Platt Amendment. All right, let's talk about the Philippines really quick. Philippines thought they would receive independence like Cuba. They were not included in the peace negotiations whatsoever. So we have a guy by the name of Emilio Aguinaldo. Hope I pronounced that right. Sorry, I'm just not good with pronunciations. Wanted revenge. He and his followers engage in guerrilla warfare. Um, he is eventually captured, and many, 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 many years later, July 4th, 1946, 
same date as American independence, the Philippines are granted independence. This is after World War II when many countries are given up their colonies. Okay, let's talk about China. If you think back to world history, if you're in New York State, you take Global 2, you'll remember spheres of influence, this idea that different countries establish spheres of influence in China. The U.S. is afraid that they'll miss out on some markets because spheres of influence, you get exclusive trading rights there. So, I should say Secretary of State John Hay establishes the open door note, and the purpose of this was to ensure the U.S. would not be locked out of China. In other words, we know you guys have your spheres of influence, but everybody should be allowed to trade in China any way they want. Then we have the Secret Society of the Harmonious Fist, or more commonly known as the Boxers. They lead a rebellion. They're, they're against foreigners, and they chant death to foreign devils, and it is broken up by multinational groups. Let's go back to domestic affairs right now. In 1900, we have an election. McKinley is easily nominated by the Republicans for another term. He won a war and acquired new land. Many people were on board with him. They approved of him. Um, he safeguarded the gold standard. So this whole idea of the gold and silver, this, this big issue of the 1890s, he was in favor of the gold standard against the the um, introduction of silver. And then he chooses Teddy Roosevelt, who is the former governor of New York and war hero as vice president. Interestingly enough, many political bosses in New York actually favored him becoming vice president because they thought, let's get him out of New York State. He's too controlling here. Um, and they thought he would just basically be vice president and you'd never hear from him again. They were wrong. Okay, William Jennings Bryan again was a Democratic nominee. Huh, he lost three different elections, presidential elections. Who else ran and lost several presidential elections? Oh my God, it's Henry Clay, yes. You cannot forget about him. Guys, it's chapter 27, I'm still including him, even though we haven't heard from him since chapter 18. It's going to be a challenge, but I'll keep doing it. Okay, and he charged, William Jennings Bryan charged, that Lincoln freed, slave, freed uh, African slaves and McKinley reestablished slavery for the Filipinos. Harsh words in that election. Now, TR, he becomes president in September 1901 when McKinley in Buffalo is shaking hands. An anarchist comes up holding a handkerchief around his hand, has a gun inside him, shoots him twice in the stomach. Uh, one kind of grazes his back, I think, and the other one hits him right in the stomach. Secret Service starts beating this guy up, and McKinley's response was, go easy on him, boys. The man just shot him, and he tells the Secret Service to go easy on them. Crazy stuff. So, TR becomes the youngest president ever. John F. Kennedy is the youngest president elected ever, but TR is the youngest president ever. Uh, his motto was, speak softly and carry a big stick. Use, and this means to use diplomacy often, but don't be afraid to use force if necessary. And he believed that the president may take any action in the general interest that is not specifically forbidden by the laws of the Constitution. So, would he be in favor of strictly or loosely interpreting the Constitution? You said loosely, you are correct. All right, Panama Canal, this is going to be very vital to U.S. interests. This cut down travel time for shipping in the military. We have two treaties. The first one is the Hay P Treaty, I'll call it, of 1901. And this gave the U.S. the right to build a canal and the right to fortify it. Problem was, Colombia, who was then in control of Panama, didn't like this treaty. So they said, no, U.S., you don't have the right to build the canal. On November 3rd, 1901, there is a rebellion that starts in Panama, and it's influenced by the United States. And they actually send down some ships there, and they don't allow the Colombians to put down the rebellion. Panama gets its independence, and the Hay Buena Varilla Treaty, Varilla? Right. Sorry. Gave the U.S. the right to build the canal and widened it to 10 miles. So this treaty gives the U.S. the right to build the Panama Canal, which is oh so important to the United States. Let's talk about the Roosevelt Corollary. Wicked, wicked, wicked important. Okay, let's do a quick... Well, we'll get to that in a second. Germany and Britain have a lot of money owed to them by Latin American countries. So TR feared they would become involved violating the Monroe Doctrine. Remember the Monroe Doctrine from 1823 during President Monroe's administration, however, written by Secretary of State John Quincy Adams. It says to Europe, stay out of Latin America. You are not welcome here. Teddy Roosevelt is afraid that Germany and Britain will get involved because they are owed money. So his response is something called the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. And he says in future financial instances, the U.S. would intervene and pay off debts. So Germany, Britain, if you're owed money, the U.S. is going to pay that money to keep you out. 
And the impact of this corollary is the U.S. is now more involved in Latin America, and there's going to be lots of resentment from many in Latin America and many Latin American countries. All right, in Russia, in the early 1900s, 1905, we have the, uh, Japan the Russo-Japanese War, and Japan humiliates Russia with a superior navy. And Japan is very, very powerful at this time. And Japan secretly asked Teddy Roosevelt to help reach a peace agreement. So he does, and in doing so, he wins the Nobel Prize in 1906. However, Russia is really upset because they felt they got the short end of the stick in the treaty. I think this is the last slide. You're doing great. Thanks for hanging in there. The Japanese in California, in 1906, San Francisco, the San Francisco School Board segregates Asian students. So they have a separate school for Asian students. Japan is furious about this. They cannot believe it. San Francisco gets rid of the segregation with the urging of Teddy Roosevelt, and he and Japan reach what is known as the Gentleman's Agreement. Very, very important to know. And what it says is Japan would stop immigrants from coming to the U.S. by withholding passports. So they would simply cut off immigration to the United States. This is yet another example of nativism. We have the root Takira. Takahira Agreement, which says that the U.S. and Japan would respect each other's territory in the Pacific and they would up and they would uphold the open door policy. All right, I threw a lot of stuff at you guys. Um, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. If you have ideas about future videos, let me know. I ask you, I've had a lot of people subscribe lately. I really appreciate that. Please subscribe down here if you have not already. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to let everybody you know, people in your class, if I can, if you can throw this on Twitter, Facebook, the links to this video or other videos, I would really, really appreciate it. I'm trying to reach as many people as possible. You may be cool, but you'll never be Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt writing a moose cool. But if you subscribe, you'll be pretty darn close. So I appreciate you guys listening. Let me know if you have any questions. Have a good day, guys.